Hello and welcome to my Jack Tech of Nahiri Control in Modern. Uh, so basically what we're trying to do is ultimate Nahiri, get Emrakul, and win. So what Nahiri does, she's a planeswalker, comes down for two generic, red and a white. Its abilities are as follows. Plus two, you may discard a card if you do draw a card. Minus two, exile target enchantment, tapped artifact or tapped creature. And minus eight, search the library for an artifact creature or creature, put it onto the battlefield against haste, return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. And it comes down on four. So, the goal of the deck is to minus eight Nahiri, get Emrakul the Aeon's Torn, and win. So, before I talk about that plan in particular, I'm going to go through what Nahiri does. So, the May clause in her plus two is really important because if we have a good hand, I don't have to discard a card to increase her loyalty and get closer to the ultimate. Because if I have a card, some cards that I really need or cards that will help keep my opponent at bay, if I discard one of them and draw a land, I'm just down another avenue that ensures my victory. So, the May clause is very important there. Uh, the minus two. The minus two helps protect Nahiri. It also helps. It also just allows us to play Nahiri's for value. If we have multiple Nahiri's, or if there's a problematic enchantment and/or creature, Nahiri is an effective removal spell. Um, if we're trying to, if the opponent has somehow reduced their life total, but they have a leyline of sanctity in play, we can play Nahiri and exile the leyline and bolt them to death or electrolyze them, whatever works. Or if there's a problematic creature that's tapped and been beating on us this entire time, we can exile it. And then, at that point, since it's a minus two and she comes out on four, she's down to two loyalty. And that can be good and bad. It can be good in the sense, if we have a, a multiple of Nahiri, and we're playing, especially if we're playing against Burn, it's really good against Burn, because what'll happen is they'll spend their turn killing Nahiri because she's so easy to kill. Either they'll attack her to death, or they'll burn her out. And those are attacks and burn spells or destruction spells that aren't hitting us. Or they aren't hitting our creatures, or they aren't hitting, they aren't going to be there to hit the next Nahiri. So I'm okay with just playing value in Nahiris. Um, so we've talked about what we're trying to do. Now we're, uh, how we, how we get to the win condition. This is our actual win condition. This is Emrakul the Aeon's Torrid. It's a 15-15 for 15 generic mana. Can't be countered. But we're not really worried about that because we're not casting it. Also, we're not worried about the second part of Emrakul. When you cast him, you take an extra turn. We'll never cast him. We don't have the mana. The only way we could ever cast him is if we got Blood Moon. Um, <coughs> Emrakul has Flying. Protection from Colored Spells and Annihilator 6. For those of you who don't know, Annihilator is an ability that allows... So when we attack with Emrakul, the defending player has to sacrifice X permanence, in this case X is 6, uh, before c blockers are even declared. And a lot of times the Annihilator 6 is what causes the concession and what allows us to win. Because if we play Nahiri on curve and ult Emrakul on time, generally speaking, they don't they have to sacrifice a bunch of their lands, and then they don't have enough mana to continue the game and play efficiently. Uh, and then they take 15 to the face, which can be problematic, or so I'm told. Um, and when Emrakul is put into a graveyard from anywhere, he shuffles it into his or her library. That is important, because if we get Emrakul in hand, there's nothing we can do with her. She sits there. Like I said, we can't cast him. We don't have enough mana sources in our deck to cast him. So, we can use Nahiri's plus two to discard Emrakul, shuffle it back in, and continue the, the gravy train of value to search for Emrakul and put her into play. Um, we can also use Desolate Lighthouse to put Emrakul into the graveyard, but I'll get into, into that in a minute. So, we know what the deck is trying to do. We, we understand the win condition and how we get there. So, let's talk about how we, we establish our dominance and just win. Uh, so let's start with the lands, the most arguably the most important part of any deck. Um, so we have 24 lands. Being a control deck, we want to hit lots of our land, most of our land drops. Uh, we'll start with our fetch package. We have four arid mesa, which is mountain or plains, and we have four flood strand, which is islander plains. 
the lands that are fetchable in this deck are a singleton hallowed fountain and I two islands, a mountain, a plains, one sacred foundry, and two steam vents. Those are our lands that are searchable with our fetch lands. Um, then we have two uh, lands, uh, Sulphur Falls and Glacial Fortress, which come in untapped if you control an island or a mountain or an island and a plains, respectively. We have a Ghost Quarter and a Desolate Lighthouse, which are colorless mana sources, but they all have abilities that are relevant. Both of them have abilities that are really relevant. So Ghost Quarter can sacrifice, destroy any land. Its controller searches his library for a basic and puts it onto the battlefield untapped, which is important because um, we can use that on ourselves. But I'll get into that in a second. So Ghost Quarter is good in a lot of matchups. It's good against any deck with man lands. It's good against Tron, because it disrupts their Tron. Um, it's good against any deck that puts enchantments onto its own lands. It's good against decks that, like, Koth of the Hammer decks. Uh, it's just a good card, and we can also use it to our own gains. If we needed uh, an additional blue source or cryptic command, we can tap a land get the, the color that that land produces, and then Ghost Quarter to search for a basic island and cast whatever we need to cast, or whatever, get whatever mana fixing we need. But that's obviously worse, a worst-case scenario sort of thing, but we can use this ability to our advantage. Uh, next is the Desolate Lighthouse, which I mentioned earlier. It taps for colorless, but it also has an ability 1 and blue-red. Tap it to draw a card and then discard a card. It's a good way to get rid of Emrakul out of our hand if we have uh, if we don't have Nahiri. It's a good so if we're behind on board and we need spells but we're only drawing lands but we have a, a, a lighthouse, we can loot and potentially draw some action. So it's really good for keeping us in the game. And lastly we have four man lands. Um we have two Celestial Colonies, and they're called Manlands because they can become creatures. Enters the battlefield tapped, add a white or a blue to your mana pool. It also has three white-blue. Uh, until in a turn, Celestial Colony becomes a 4-4 white and blue elemental creature with flying and vigilance. It's still land. This is generally considered to be one of the best Manlands because of the vigilance in my, and the flying. Because it has two static abilities, and it's a 4-4, which is nothing to scoff at. Um... And we also have two Wandering Fumerals, which tap for blue and red. But for two, a blue and a red becomes a 1-4 blue-red elemental creature with zero. Switch this creature's power and toughness until end of turn, it's still land. So, I do, a lot of decks like this run just the four colonnade. I do the 2-2 two -two split, just because I like to have diverse threats. If they come down and they needle colonnade, I still have access to Fumeral. And vice versa. Also, I'm more willing to throw away a colonnade than I am, or a uh, excuse me, a fumeral rather than a colonnade, just because colonnade can fly and has vigilance. So uh, sometimes I will chump with a, a fumeral, switch power and toughness, and just trade. I'm more than willing to do that. Not so willing to do that with colonnade, just because I feel like if I'm activating colonnade, it's a it's a bigger commitment. It's really not, but I. Just from a card economy standpoint, I, I'd like to have my colonnades untapped, and I'd rather use them to evade creatures on the ground and hit my opponent. Um, so I just like to have a diverse th threat, and also it just helps to have redundancy in your mana base just to make your, your mana base more consistent. So now we're going to get into the spell package, things that let us get into the driver's seat early and take control. So we have 14 one-drops, we have 4 path to exile... Just one of the best removal spells in Modern. Exile a creature. Its controller gets a land. It, I would rather have Swords to Plowshares because I don't like mana fixing my opponent. But it is what it is. Swords isn't legal in Modern. So it's just it's just all around good. Especially for its mana cost. It gets around indestructible. It's just a great card. We have the arguably the best draw spell in Modern given that we don't have Ponder or Preordain in the form of Serum Visions. Draw a card. Scry 2. It lets us dig for whatever we need, lets us fix the top of our deck, get rid of stuff we don't want. Uh, we have two Spell Snare. Spell Snare counters a target spell with converted mana cost 2. 
this is great because it it stops all of these cards, which are very prevalent and modern. I'll get to those in a minute. But it also stops Boros Charm, Atarkas Command, all these spells that cost two for one mana. It's very efficient. It's good at what it does. But that said, it's very narrow. That's why I only run two. Against decks that don't run a lot of powerful two drops, I will side it out. Uh, it It's just a good counter spell, though. It, but it's so narrow that we don't want too many of them, so that way they don't get stuck in our hand. Uh, and then for Lightning Bolt, kind of like Path, it's just a good removal spell. It's cheap, it's good at what it does. It can kill players if our opponent has shocked in or taken damage at any point, and they're at 18 life, for instance, and we attack with Emrakul, and they don't concede. We can just bolt them. We can bolt creatures, we can... It's just really, it's just a really solid card. It has... It can go upstairs if we need it to. And uh, it deals with creatures rather efficiently. At, in the two slot, we have two mana leak. <laughs> really simple counter target spell unless it's controller pays three. Ideally, we're playing it in a situation where, our control where their controller can't pay it. But if they can pay it, that's it is what it is. Make them pay three for whatever they're trying to do. It... I've played it even in even in spots where it's not good to do it if the spell I'm countering is not good, but they want to do it just to get them to tap out so they can't do anything else that turn. Um, so the the paying three clause can be either good or bad. Uh, we have three remand. I have kind of a love hate relationship with this card just because it doesn't really get rid of the threat in a lot of circumstances. Uh, but the reason it's good is it draws a card. You could have a card like Unsubstantiate in Modern, or in uh, Standard, which which was a card printed in Eldritch Moon, which returns a spell or creature to its owner's hand. This just returns the spell. It doesn't target creatures, but it draws a card. That's why Remand is better than Unsubstantiate. You can cast this on an uncounterable spell. It won't counter it, but you still get to draw a card. And the drawing a card is just... It's a good tempo play. It's That's all it's for. It's not... I don't really consider it a counter spell because it doesn't deal with a threat. I consider it a draw spell that tempos my opponent. And that's why it's good. That's why it's good. It doesn't deal with a threat, which is kind of... Which is why I personally don't love it. Because it doesn't deal with what's going on, but I do get to draw a card, and sometimes that can be game shifting. Uh, then we have four Snapcaster Mage. This is my favorite card in Modern, hands down. I would not play Modern if not for Snapcaster Mage. Uh, flash when it enters the battlefield, target instant or sorcery gains flashback equal to its mana cost until end of turn. This effectively gives us four additional copies of every spell in our deck. It's a good chump blocker. It can come down even if we're not flashing back something. It can trade with a Monastery Swiss Spear. It can attack. It can do anything we need it to. It's just a really solid card. Next we have, in the 3 slot, we have two Timely Reinforcements, which is in here. A lot of decks like this run it in the sideboard, but I run it in the main just because there's so many aggressive decks, and it also helps us stay ahead in the race. Even if we have, we're have we ahead on life, I can still play for the three blockers. So it reads, if you have less life than an opponent, you gain six life, and if you have fewer creatures than an opponent, you get three one ones. It's just great against burn. It's phenomenal against burn. Or goblins, decks that are really aggressive. Because even if you're one life behind, you gain six. If you're... It can put you from 12 to 18, and... You can block for a turn or three. And that alone can give you enough time to get back in control of the game. Just an excellent card. Um, more than happy to flash it back with Snapcaster Mage. It's, the value here is just phenomenal. Very often am I playing it and getting through 1-1s and gaining life. Even in, in matchups where it's not as good as like Burn. It, if, if I'm playing against Eldrazi and Taxes, for instance, I'll still play it in a heartbeat because they are still blockers and it is still 6 life. It helps us stay alive and it helps us stay in control. It gives, gives us time, which is very often what we need. Now we have more disruption in the form of Vendillion Click. Enters the battlefield, target player reveals their hand. You get to choose a non-land card from it. That player reveals the chosen card and puts it on the bottom of the library and draws a card. It's just disruption. We can play it on their draw step, pick out whatever they drew, and put it on the bottom. They do get to draw a new card, but if we're if we're playing against a deck that wants to hardcast this Emrakul for value, 
then we can put that Emrakul on the bottom, and we won't have to worry about it. We're playing against Jund, and we're about to win, but they drew a Dreadbore, which destroys Planeswalkers. We can put that on the bottom. Don't need to worry about it. It's also a 3-1 that flies, so it's a threat, and it's also a very good blocker. Just an all-around card. It's a good one of in the main. Next, we have two Electrolyze. Electrolyze is just a good value card. It deals two damage divided as you choose to any number of two, two target creatures and or players, and then draws a card. It costs one and a blue and a red, so it's not... For what it does, it's it's costed fairly. I mean, if, if, if it cost a blue and a red, it would be broken in half, but because it draws a card is why it's so good. And also, it gives us the ability to two-for-one our opponent. Against Soul Sisters, I can deal with two Soul Wardens or Soul's Attendants and draw a card. Against Merfolk, I can kill things if they kill Mer um, Silvergill Adepts and draw cards. It's just a good tempo play. It's just good for two for wanting our opponent and getting ahead on card, getting us card advantage. Next, we have a card that basically reads, you win the game. <coughs> this is Cryptic Command. It's one and three blue. Choose two. Counter target spell. Return target permanent to its owner's hand. Tap all creatures your opponent's control and draw a card. So, counter spell. Um, I'm trying to think of a card that just that reads return target permanent to its owner's hand. I guess Echoing Truth in a way, except for everything that makes Echoing Truth Echoing Truth. Um, it's unsummon, except target permanent. Fog and draw card. All of those effects are really good. It's the most diverse command, I believe, in the command cycle. A lot of them are very narrow. For instance, the white command is all creature, just creature and permanent destruction. The black one is life loss and reanimation effects. The green one is all about creatures. It's, I think it's just the best one. A lot of people agree with me as well. Um, countering a spell, stop whatever we're, our opponent is doing. Returning a permanent can return a problesome, problesome uh, permanent if our opponent has something that's stopping Nahiri, like a pithy needle. And they played it while Nahiri's on 8. We can deal with that. We can return an attacking creature to its owner's hand. We can. It's just a good value play. Tapping all creatures your opponent's control has won me the game. Uh, if Nahir, I've had situations where Nahiri is about to ult, but they have a lethal attack against me, or they can reduce Nahiri's uh, loyalty to where I can't ultimate that turn. I can, at the beginning combat step, I can tap all their creatures and draw a card or whatever. I want to do and stop them from attacking, untap myself, and ultimate Nahiri and win. It's good for staving off the attack. It's just, oh. And then drawing a card. So drawing a card, we can choose to target, counter target spell and bounce a permanent or tap their permanents. But if we have, and if we don't need to do either of those things, we can just draw a card and get some card advantage. It just replaces itself. It's just a great card. It replaces itself. It has lots of options. It's it's everything we want to be doing. Next, we have Supreme Verdict. Really simple. Can't be countered. Destroy all creatures. Great board wipe. Uh, deals with whatever our, our opponent is doing. And it can't be flashbacked. It just helps us stay ahead. Moving on to the sideboard. We have a Celestial Purge. Two Rest in Peace, two Stony Silence, a Dispel, the Gate, a Vendillion Click, two Crumble of Dust, an Anger of the Gods, two Geist of St. Traft, a Counterflux, and a Wear Tear. Starting from over here, this Wear Tear, this is Wear Tear. It destroys target artifact for one red, and for one white, destroy target enchantment. And it can be fused, so both can be cast at the same time. Great against Affinity, great against any deck with enchantments. Um, great again. I'd bring it in against Lantern Affinity, as I mentioned. Um, just helps us deal with things that our creature removal can't deal with. It's all. It's just all around great card. Um, arguably one of the better fuse cards. Next we have Counterflux, which is red and two blue. Uh, can't be countered by spells or abilities, and it's just a counter spell, counter target spell you don't control, and it overloads for an additional generic. And if you don't know what Overload does, it basically replaces the word target with each. So if there was a counter war going on, we could Overload, Counterflux, and counter all of our opponent's spells. 
we bring it in against control matchups. Anything, any, any deck that has counter spells, it just helps us stop whatever they're doing indefinitely because they can't deal with it. Um, next, we have two Geist of Saint Traft. This is our alternate win condition if Nahiri isn't going to work. Or we bring it in against decks that will have stuff to answer Nahiri, but won't have things to answer the Geist. So Geist comes down for 3 mana, and uh, it has Hexproof. It's a 2-2 two, two for 2, or for 3. It has Hexproof. Whenever it attacks, though, it puts a 4-4 four, four white angel token with flying onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. Exile that token at the end of combat. So... Really tough for our opponents to deal with it if they are playing targeted removal. They need something like Liliana the Veil to make us sacrifice it. It's a really good threat to have when your opponent is expect expecting Planeswalkers to be the only way that you can win. Play this out. They can't deal with it. They don't have a blocker. Anything. And you can just beat down. And... Even if Geist is going to die, that angel is generally still going to get in. If they're at four and they have a, a blocker, you can attack. You can send that angel in to kill them, even though Geist won't get through. So that angel is just devastating. It comes down on turn three and it beats down for six. Uh, next, after that, we have two. We have a single Anger of the Gods. Anger of the Gods just another board wipe for small creatures. Deals three damage to each creature. And if it were dealt damage this way and would die this turn, exile it instead. Great against burn, great against goblins, great against zoo. It's just another board wipe that comes down uh, for a cheaper mana cost. Just all around good. I'd bring it in against any deck that runs small creatures. Um, next we have two crumbles at us, which kind of like Ghost Quarter. Deals with manlands, deals with Tron, except it deals with them in a final way. So, exile, target non-basic land, search its controller's graveyard, hand, and library for any other cards, number of cards with the same name, exile them, and then that player shuffles his or her library. So it deals with manlands permanently. I will bring it in against Jund and use it on Raging Ravine to deal with it with their manland, so I don't have to worry about that. I'll bring it in against Tron, so that way they're ne never a able to assemble it. So that way they have to cast their Karns and their Worm Coils fairly. All around good card. Um, I, I bring it in against slow matchups for sure. Eldrazi matchups. Uh, sometimes I will bring it in against Eldrazi and Taxes to get rid of their Caverns of Souls and their uh, Eldrazi Temples. Next, one more V-Click just for additional disruption. I bring it in against Control, generally, or Jund. One Dispel. Pretty simple. Counter target instant spell. Good against any deck with counter spells. Or target or removal if we're worried about that. Uh, one negate, counter target young creature spell. Again, kind of like the spell. Great against counter spell decks. Great against uh, decks that are trying to combo off like Abnasium with uh, spells. Next, we have two Stony Silence, which uh, artifact uh, activated abilities of artifacts can't be activated. Great against Affinity. Ends the game against Affinity and Lantern Control. They cannot beat it. Uh, I'll bring in any of this Tron as well. They have a hard time getting around Stony Silence unless they already have Tron. Because they can't use their uh, Chromatic Stars and Chromatic Spheres to, to filter their mana and to dig. Or they, and they can't use um, Os Oblivion Stone to wipe the board and keep things clear. And uh, Relic of Echinitus to, to exile their opponent's graveyards and draw cards. It just shuts off a large por portion of their deck and a large portion of how they get to what they need to get to for the win. Next we have two Rest in Peace, which exiles all cards from all graveyards and then prevents any cards from being put into a graveyard. Uh, this is... This card, kind of like Stony Silence, can just win us the game in the right matchup. It's terrible for Dredge to play against because it exiles their yard and prevents things from going into the yard so they can't do anything. It's really good against uh, Jund. Turns their Tarmogoyfs into zero ones forever. It's bad for us in a couple of ways, though. But it can be worse for our opponents. That's why we play it. It's bad for us because it turns off our Snapcaster Mage. It turns us. It turns it into a 2-1 with Flash. Which is fine. I would rather have a 2-1 with fa Flash and a Rest in Peace out and prevent my opponent from doing stuff than have nothing but have a Snapcaster Mage. What this does to our opponent is way worse than what it does to us. Except for in the case of Emrakul. So, I think I mentioned this earlier, but if in case I didn't, if Emrakul is in our hand, we can't do anything with it. 
So when we discard Emrakul, we shuffle it into our library. Well, if Emrakul is put into the graveyard from anywhere, we shuffle it into our library. So we can search for it with Nahiri still. The problem is, if it goes into the graveyard with Rest in Peace out, it's gone. And there's nothing we can do about that. We can still win without Emrakul, it's just going to be more difficult and take longer. We still have the Colonnades, we still have the Snapcasters, the V-Clicks, and the Burn Spells, but it'll just be significantly more difficult. So unfortunately, Rest in Peace does hamper that plan, but what, from what it can do to our opponent, it's well worth the cost. And besides, the chances of us drawing Emrakul in that sort of situation are low, so I'm really t willing to take the risk. And if nothing else, we can do things with like Cryptic Command to bounce it. If we have to, we can exile it with Nahiri. So we can deal with our own Rest in Peace. And it's, for what it does, it, it's just game ending in some situations. We also have one Celestial Purge. Pretty simple, exile target, black or red permanent, great against Blood Moon, Liliana, any black or red creatures, aggressive decks. We bring it in against any black or red deck uh, in general, just as a good catch-all for whatever they're trying to do. Um, it gets rid of a lot of really problematic cards for us, like Liliana of the Veil. Vale. Um, that's it, that's the deck. Um... There are decks that run, uh, like, Lightning Helix instead of things like Timely Reinforcements. I wanted this deck to be a lot more reactive and controlling. So, that's the deck and that sideboard. I will see you in the games.